There's speed yoga. You can do speed meditation. You can attend drive through funerals, right? It's like everything is it's got I'm to get sorry. faster and faster. <laughs> did you just say drive through funerals? I'm afraid That's... I did. And it wasn't a punchline. It's a real thing. You know, oh, the church places my. the coffin at the entrance. The mourners pull up by car and they say farewell to a loved one through a pane of glass, right? It's like, you it's like are picking, kidding me. It's like picking, you are it's like picking up a latte me. at a drive through Starbucks. Yeah. Okay. By the way, if I, if I pass, like if, if anyone tries to give me a drive through funeral, I'm coming back and I'm haunting you. Welcome to It Gets Late Early. Today I have with me Carl Honore. He has been called the voice of the slow movement. He's an author. He's a journalist. Uh, he has worked at The Economist and the Miami Herald, for, to name a few. And he's also given not one, but two TED Talks. So welcome, Carl. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. So happy to have you here. So I guess first and foremost, can you explain to me what would you say is the slow movement? Uh, yeah, well... We live in a world obsessed with speed where every moment of the day feels like a race against the clock. And we pay a high price for that. I think many of us are racing through life instead of actually living it. And the slow movement is a is a pushback. It's I can maybe tell you what it's not. It's not about doing everything slowly, right? I'm not an extremist of slowness. I love speed, right? Faster is often better. We all know that, but not always. And that's kind of the key that unlocks this slow movement or slow revolution. It's the idea of doing things at the right speed. So sometimes fast, but other times you slow things right down. Like musicians talk about the tempo justo, the correct tempo for each piece of music. And that kind of gets at what slow is all about. It's about finding the right rhythm, the right pace, the right tempo, the right cadence for every moment. I think if you drill a little deeper, it's slow is really a mindset. It's quality over quantity. It's being present in the moment, yes. doing one thing at a time. If you remember when we used to do that. What's that like? I don't know. <laughs> Ultimate, I suppose, slow is doing everything not as fast as possible, but as well as possible, which is an immensely simple idea, but one with the power to revolutionize literally everything you do. Right. And definitely the tech industry that moves at a speed of light. And I think at, at its own detriment many, many times. So I think that is something that we could all really take in. I know when I speak with my friends and people within the tech industry and beyond, we're all like, gosh, there's just so much happening, especially if you're, if you're parents or your caregivers in any way, shape or form. It's just we're constantly being pulled in 8 billion different directions. So how have, you, how have you found yourself to be the voice of this movement? Like what led you to get into this space? Well, I think that when we get stuck in fast forward, it often takes a shock to the system or a wake up call to make us realize that we've forgotten how to put the brakes on and that this is doing us real harm. For a lot of people that wake up form will, will come, it'll come in the shape of an illness, right? The body one day will say, that's it. Can't take the pace anymore. And who knows, you, you know, one day you can't get out of bed or you have a burnout. My wake up call came when I started reading bedtime stories to my son. And in those days, I was just so fast that I, I would speed read Snow White. Yeah. So my version was so fast. It had three dwarves. I mean, it was just really not a good scene. Right? You know, my son would say, he would say, you know, what, what, what happened to Grumpy? And, and I, I knew this was wrong, but I just couldn't slow down. And, and, the, and the, the, the real shock when I really hit rock bottom, when I found myself flirting with buying a book I'd heard about called the one minute bedtime story. So Snow White in 60 <laughs> seconds. And I remember thinking, Hallelujah. Brilliant. Man, I need that book now. You, Amazon, right? Drone yeah. delivery. <laughs> you hacked bedtime. You thought you yeah. hacked bedtime. <laughs> you, I optimized bedtime. And, yeah. and, 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 and it was just, it was literally one of those out of body experiences where I caught myself and I thought, whoa, what has happened to you? Right. Are you, are you really willing to fob off your son with a sound bite instead of a story? And I just thought <laughs> I have lost my way here. I've lost my compass. I've just lost my mind. And I realized then that I had to, had to slow down. That's kind of where it all started for me. Wow. Yeah. I think that that would hit me right in the gut as well. But I think that what you just spoke of is something that so many parents can relate to. I mean, it's super resonant for me. I, I know myself at the end of a long day when I know I have a gazillion other things that I need to do that I didn't get accomplished because, you know, I work, right? And then you have the second shift with the kids. It's like, you just want to get through it. But what is life really all about? So I, I get what you're saying and I can see how that would just be one of those pivotal moments. Yeah. I mean, there's a wonderful quote from Mae West, the starlet from the black and white era, who said <laughs> once, she said, anything worth doing is worth doing slowly. And I think that's a very pointed and bang on the money <laughs> sentiment that could affect and, and, and actually holds true in everything from 
you know, from the bedroom to the boardroom, right? It's, it's how you approach a bedtime story to your child. It's also how you approach a meeting in the workplace, right? Or writing a piece of software. You don't go in hell for leather. Sometimes it makes sense to move fast to break things, but at other times it makes sense to slow down and ask if breaking things is the right move at this moment. <laughs> right? It's kind of a funny I wish tech balance, would ask right? that question more. Yeah. That's uh, that's something we need to be a little bit more cautious of in the tech mm. industry. Especially sure. with AI, of course, now, because oh my gosh. the whole yes. speed equation has just ratcheted up many, many notches. And the speed that we've had from Silicon Valley in the last years has in and of itself, I think, brought all kinds of wondrously good things, but but problems as well. But I think AI right. is going to it's going to amplify that on a scale 100%. that's probably reaching unimaginable. So this is a time, it's a specifically yeah. a time like this when everything is moving fast that we as human beings need to slow down because it's yeah. only then that we will understand the change, be able to unpack it, make sense of it, and then fashion it and direct it in a direction that works for us as a, as a, as a species, right? Yeah. If we don't, if we don't have that moment to pause and to ask the big questions and to join the dots and parse and pull things apart, we're going to make some very bad decisions. And oh, yeah. that, that was that was already pretty noxious when you know social media went off the rails and Precisely. began to become a, a problem rather than maybe a solution. Think of how much worse it will be if we don't get it right with AI. Uh, you are absolutely speaking my most inner thoughts. It's just, we've seen this movie before and we know what happens. I don't want to be in this movie. Let's take a step back. Let's press pause. Let's not maybe have, you know, like an arms race with for-profit companies towards AI that they don't even really completely understand the power of. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> so I'm with you. How did we get here as humans? Like, what brought us to this point? Like, we used to be very different creatures, it seems, and now we're hooked on this this speed thing. We did. I mean, it's a, you can write a whole book. I did, in fact. <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> didn't you? How we, how <laughs> I think we, you did. <laughs> how, we, how, we, how we got here. But there is a there is a fast version uh, of, of how, we, how we got so quick. I mean, there are many interlacing historical trends and so on, you know, but you can go back to when we first began measuring time with clocks that created schedules that made for deadlines that began to speed us up a little bit. Then we got into the industrial era where machines gave us the power to do things faster and faster. We began measuring productivity in terms of time, how fast you could churn out a widget in the factory, the faster you did it, the more money you made. So that kind of idea of productivity in the workplace tied to speed became welded into our culture, then it spilled out of the factories and colonized every corner of our lives. So that now we're looking at ways to optimize bedtime stories, right? <laughs> or how to speed up, you know, there's speed yoga, you can do speed meditation, you can attend drive through funerals, right? It's like everything is it's got I'm to sorry. get faster and faster. <laughs> did you just say drive through funerals? I'm afraid That's... I did. And it wasn't a punchline. It's a real thing. You know, oh, the church places my. the coffin at the entrance, the mourners pull up by car, and they say farewell to a loved one through a pane of glass, right? It's like, you it's like are picking, kidding me. It's like picking, you are it's like picking up a latte at a drive through Starbucks. You know? Okay, by the way, if I if I pass, like if, if anyone tries to give me a drive through funeral, I'm coming back and I'm haunting you. That is yeah, right. ridiculous. Exactly. Like, yeah. What about yeah. the sanctity of life? That is crazy. Where yeah. Which culture does this, pray tell? Like, well, I'll give you one guess. <laughs> the oh, United God. States. I was worried. I was worried, but I've never been to a drive through funeral, so I'm like, this can't be here. Oh, my gosh. Wow. We have it also wrong. And, and I think there's something about consumerism that makes us speed up because there's only so many minutes in the day to, to buy stuff, right? To, to, yeah. to consume it. So we go faster and faster. The whole world has become this infinite smorgasbord of things to eat, consume, have, experiment with. And we just, the natural human instinct is to want to have it all. But yeah. having it all means hurrying it all. And then, of course, Oof. the final surge or more recent surge in speed, I think, goes down to the tech we've created, right? These gadgets that allow us to do everything at the swipe of a screen or the blink of an eye, which has its benefits, right? I mean, I'm not a Luddite. I've got a, <laughs> you know, a, Mac, a MacBook. I've got an iPhone. These things are fun <laughs> toys. AirPods. They're incredible <laughs> yeah, tools for things. productivity. But they have conditioned us to expect everything to happen at so the speed quickly. of software. And I think so that's, true. you know, so if you put all of those factors together and you end up with a cocktail with the word speed written all over it. 
we are so impatient. And there are times when I have to check myself. I'm like, wait, I am getting frustrated that I can't load whichever movie that I want on my phone at a moment's notice. Like it's buffering and I'm angry. Like what's wrong with me? Like that is crazy. This is where we are now that we're in this rat race of speed which and and like it's like it's an arms race because of course it's one thing gets faster and everybody gets we just get faster and faster and faster and we all know where arms races lead to right mutually yeah, assured okay. destruction a hundred percent and i think there is this culture of obsession with youth too right the 30 under 30 list all of this you know virtuoso young genius you know the boy wonder that sort of trope like that is so ingrained in our culture and it makes that, us all yeah. feel like we have to hurdle through space to get to some you know, pillar of achievement by a certain date, or you're just a has been. And I know that that is particularly the case in the tech industry. Yes, I think, I mean, that kind of dovetails with the other work I've done. Obviously, most of my work and writing has been about slowing down and the power of slow, uh, slow, slowness as a superpower in a fast world and all that. But my most recent work has been about aging and attacking, taking, so I was before taking on the cult of speed, now I've been taking on as well the cult of youth. And if you think of how those two overlap, you've put your finger on one of the touch points right there, is in a world that venerates youth and abhors aging, what do you do? You create these incredibly tight deadlines in people's lives. Yes. So it's like, okay, if you haven't got the perfect career, uh, the ideal life partner, travel to all the best by 30, you know, it's it's finished, it's right? Because at 30, it's, it's all downhill. And that's preposterous. Of course it's not, right? I remember thinking, I felt like that. I used to be a, a fully signed up member of the cult of youth. And in my 20s thinking, I have got to get this, this, this and done by 30 because at 30, that's my peak, right? And everything is going to get worse from there. And I got to 30 and I realized, hang on, uh-uh. <laughs> I'm actually feeling like everything is falling into place. But 40, oh, come on, 40, that's game over. Uh, then I got to 40 now. and I thought, you know what? I actually feel like I'm at the top of my game. So Exactly. I'm in my prime, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. And so many, and I think we have different primes. We have different peaks all the way through these long lives and the world has changed. The demographic Mm -hmm. tectonic plates have shifted. You come out of uh, university or college now, you could easily be looking at 60 years, six decades in the workplace. And the idea that you would only be useful to a company up to the age of 35 is not it's weapons grade nonsense, right? I mean, Couldn't it's, it's bad for us, but it's actually bad for companies as well because in many ways we get better at our jobs as we get older. We become better employees. <laughs> what a concept! Experience mm. matters. Yeah, it's goes so, so true. much against the grain. I mean, I think I think you know, I'm not sure if anyone's been able to draw a, a data line <laughs> that proves this case, but I suspect some of the most egregious errors that we see occur in in the tech industry in Silicon Valley is down to the fact that it's a culture based on the silly idea that you're finished at 40, right? So there's nobody in the room over 40. Everybody's under 40. And people under 40 can be luminously intelligent and and they can be wise. They can be savvy. They can be incredibly capable. But multi-generational teams are far, far better at making decisions, at joining the dots, at seeing the big picture, understanding how the world fits together and making better decisions. So if you have companies where everybody is 28, you're going to make worse decisions than if you have a mix of ages. That's just a fact. But try selling that in some of the corners of uh, the tech industry and you'll be showing the door. Less and less, though, I think, actually, to be honest. <laughs> exactly. It's like that is the goal, people. We want so, to age. <laughs> so you're, you're kind of discriminating against your, your future self. And then the other thing to remember here is, and this is one of the things I found most extraordinary and appalling in my research is that ageism, I mean, there's a lot of good research on this, that if you buy into ageist tropes and you venerate youth and you denigrate aging, you are going to age less well, right? It's actually going to affect how you age. And your lifespan, right? And your lifespan, you're going to suffer cognitive and physical decline more and you're you're could die younger as much as seven and a half years younger, which is just extraordinary. It means that ageism is the ultimate form of self-harm. Yeah. <laughs> Telling yeah. yourself, oh, I'm so old, or that was a senior moment, or I'm really showing my age here, or I'm feeling my age. All of those expressions that we spew out all over the place. All the time. Every time we utter them, we're reinforcing the myth that aging is all about decline. And we're actually right. helping ourselves age 
less well. <laughs> exactly. And it starts so young. I mean, my own kids will be like, mommy, you're old. You turned 41. You're old. I'm like, who told you I was old? Where did this come from? Like, how did society put this in your little beautiful brains? How did this happen? Right. Um, so we are, it, it does start so early, the, the stereotyping. You know, one place you see it very vividly is with um, birthday cards, right? Yes. So oh, my you, gosh. <laughs> you go look at birthday cards and you won't find any birthday cards making fun of people's race. Um, no. Probably or not their, well, their sexual orientation. Maybe, you know. Maybe gender but man, a little bit. Age, open season. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> totally. Yeah. People feel season. totally entitled to it. It's, um, yeah. I mean, I've spoken with countless people at this point uh, doing this podcast about, you know, their experience of aging in the workforce. And people have this just complete liberal attitude towards saying things about age. It doesn't even register as yeah. wrong, right? At one it way just, or the other. It just gets yeah. waved yeah. right on through. Yeah, it is. And um, I think we all have just a massive amount of work to do on our own internalized ageism. And it starts with not buying into all of that. And, you know, as I've gotten older, I have thankfully gotten wiser. And so I think that hopefully <laughs> as we get farther down the line, we can share just like a mentor would do with, you know, someone else in the workplace, right? Share the wisdom of what we've learned over the course of time and help them fear their age less, right? Fear their progression through life less and explain to them all the beauty that lies within the future for them. Because I am happier now than I've ever been. I am more capable now than I've ever been. And I have tons of vitality. And it's like, I was supposed to be done for at 40, as especially as a woman, right? And yeah. it's just, yeah. it's just not true. <laughs> it's it's just yeah. false. I mean, at its core, it's just not true, right? It's just a mm -hmm. false. It's just a. It's absolutely false. It's counterfeit. It's 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 nonsense and really unhelpful nonsense. You, you touched on something there, which I think is really important when when we talk about ways to take down the ageist industrial complex. I mean, like, <laughs> and that is is the, the future is multi generational. That's just a yep. demographic fact, right? True. But the society we live in is not multi generational. We're siloed off into age cohorts. It starts at school, right? The people in your class are all born within the same calendar year, right? And then that can carry on in a similar way all the way through our lives. And the problem with not having a social network with a rich mix of different ages is that when you don't know people of different generations or different ages, those stereotypes, the grim stereotypes can creep in and take hold. So whenever people say, what's one way to start changing the whole way we think about aging and, and reinventing aging for the 21st century, I always say, Mix with people different generations. Mix with younger people, the same age, older people. Get people old because that that's the best way to shoot down stereotypes and to build that understanding. And and you see it a lot in the workplace now and with mentoring, right? But it, it mentoring is has is not enough, right? It's now mostly reverse mentoring, and I think that's so important to get away from the idea that that mixing generations is all about older people handing down tablets of stone. No, because every pe person from every age can learn from each other, right? And it's about creating a f an even playing field where someone of 23 can teach things to someone of 63 and vice versa. And someone in the middle at 43 can come in and teach them both something or give them both a different perspective. And that's where the real richness and meaning and, and joy will come from. I agree. I agree. I, I, heard, it, I heard it referred to as a, a mentorship, like Chip Conley, who runs the Modern Elder Academy and worked at Airbnb, uh, helping the young founders, Brian Chesky and Joe Gebbia, actually start Airbnb after a long, rich career in the hospitality industry. He came into Airbnb and he found himself to be learning as much as he was giving back to others, right? And that's that's the reality. And I can tell you, I have hired two young men in their 20s to help me and social media with this particular podcast. They're fantastic. They are mm -hmm. absolutely exceptional. And I learned so much from them and get along great with them. So it really does go both ways. You can you can learn from younger and oh, older people or like we all have something to bring to the table. Yeah. So Carl, you know, the older I get, the more I desire the ability to slow down. And conversely, of course, like the more I feel like my life is full and I can't really figure out how to do it, right? Like I have all sorts of obligations for my kids. I have my own work obligations. I have my husband, my friends, my family. It's just, it's like way too much. And I'm trying to figure out how do I slow down? I desire it so much more now that I'm older and wiser. I don't want to be going fast all the time. Do you have tips for us in modern life, how we can figure out to, to slow this yeah. life down a little bit when it feels out of control? I think, I think the first step for all of us pretty much all of us is to do less 
right? I think the, the cult, <laughs> it, sounds, so, it sounds. I love <laughs> no, I love that, and it reminds me yeah. of forgetting Sarah Marshall when Paul Rudd is like on the surfboard. And he's like, "Do less, do less." He's yeah. with Jason Segel. <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> it's just two little words, but it's they just make such a difference, right? I think we're chronically trying to do way too much. So I, I think whenever I talk to people about slowing down, a, a first step is always just take some time to pause and look hard at what you're doing, what's in your schedule every week and ask yourself, what, what is really important to me? What really matters and focus on those things and let everything else go. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how much stuff is in there that isn't that important that you won't even remember you dropped mm -hmm. three months from now, or even four days from now, some of the stuff that we're, we feel we have to do. So I think it's slowing down. I mean, slowing down is a process, right? People are so rushed nowadays, they even want to slow down fast, right? Um, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I like this slow thing. I, I want the intercom of the Dalai Lama by tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. It, That's it is a process. amazing. <laughs> and and, and, it, and it's often one step forward, one step back, one step sideways, you know, and you make, but I think the beginning point is always just taking some time to, to reflect, just to, to sit with yourself, to look inside. I mean, I think a lot of us had that experience during the pandemic, right? When we were locked down. And for the first time ever, people had, you know, just stopped, right? It was a big pause button got pushed. And it was interesting how so many people came out of the pandemic thinking, having done that existential homework <laughs> for the first time ever, they came out and they said, you know what? I realize now the life I was living before was was just not the right life for me. I was on autopilot. I, I, I realize what's important and I'm going to make some big changes so that I can give my time and attention to the things that really matter to me and let everything else fall by the wayside. So, so many people have come out of the pandemic, changing careers, working in new ways, leaving bad relationships, moving from the country to the city or, the, or whatever, you know, making those big tectonic shifts. So I think we don't want another pandemic. You could do this without a pandemic. <laughs> no, please God, right. no. Heaven, heaven forbid, right? <laughs> I'm done um, on those. <laughs> carve out, carve out some time, right? Just to say to yourself, I'm going to do some, some slow homework here. Yeah. And just sit with yourself, talk to people who know you work out what's important to you and then let the other stuff go. Right. So that would be a first step. Another tip, I think coming back to tech is use that off button. Right? Mm, <laughs> you know, being yes. always on, it's not a good move. Right? No. Um, switch off whenever you can. I yeah. mean, it's always going to be there. The web is not going anywhere. It, it's going to be there when you come back social media. So just carve out times when you, I was gonna say carve out times when you were offline. I would say carve out times when you're online and make the rest of the time offline, right? I like that. So you can be present. So you can do one thing at a time. So you can focus, so you can enjoy and savor and think and create, do all the stuff we really want to do with our lives rather than being doom scrolling through 19 sites. Yeah. Oh gosh. So be, 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 use that off button, be disciplined about like, even just a small first step, turn off all notifications. Yeah. yeah. Just turn them all off. No one is that important that they need to be reachable instantly 24 hours a day and and when you because when you have your notifications on what you're actually doing is you're allowing other people to program your schedule yes they're deciding when when you're going to jump yes when gonna answer when you're going to do stuff turn them off you know oh. you, you know let people know don't just do it instantly yeah you know, but create a, a world like the one i personally now live in where i don't get interrupted by people i never miss an important call i look i keep an eye on what's there but i don't get interrupted and that's a huge shift, right? And it's quite a small that. thing in a way, notifications. You just flick off, 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 off. And it's, you're going to feel so light yeah. <laughs> afterwards when you see that long list of offs beside all of your apps. Absolutely. Um, and then just a final um, suggestion for, for ways to slow down is to incorporate some kind of slow ritual into your life. And that probably varies from person to person. It might be knitting. It might be cooking. It might be yoga or, or meditation or gardening or something that just inoculates you against the virus of hurry. <laughs> something that helps you. I love that inoculation against the virus of hurry. Oh my gosh. Sometimes it's just little moments. You don't have to spend your whole day swinging in a hammock knitting, right? You could do, you could do, that, that sounds kind of nice. Actually. You could do like, it for you know, 15 minutes. <laughs> when could I get a day like that in my schedule? Um, you know, even just 15 minutes and then the, the calm that that will bring into you will suffuse the rest of your day. You know? Right. So it's, it's sometimes just small acts of slowness can have a big payoff. 
There's so much to unpack there, but you know, one thing that comes to mind is the ubiquity of the Calendly link, right? And how people have in their email signature, hey, book a time with me on my calendar. It's like, you don't own your time if you give people that link. It's like they could just show up whenever they want, right? And uh, there's some roles at companies in tech where that is just the standard operating procedure and you have to do that. And so, man, that would be a rough one. But I think your point is very sound in that you should try to carve out times when you're off. You should try to make sure that you have control over your own destiny, so to speak. And I I think we also really teach people how we want to be treated. So I know that intentionally when I go into a new organization, I am not always on. I don't respond to emails at the first second. I don't do it at 12 at night. And I used to think if I don't do this, they're not going to think that I'm in it, that I'm hungry, that I want it, you know? And, and so there was this pressure of perception by others and, and looking as though I was just down to just do it all at any time. Like I, I don't want them to think of me in that way because that is not an appropriate, healthy boundary at all. And I, I have to actually tip my hat to Gen Z in a bit because they they are really good at boundaries, yeah. really really good at it. They're and all about boundaries. All about boundaries, and what they've Which done is, is it's yes, it's extended the value of boundaries to all the other generations in the workforce. So I'm like, thanks, Gen Z. Now it's better for everyone. Yeah. Like this is yeah. great. No, they're, but- <laughs> they're bringing lightness and hope in many ways. I think into the workforce. I I, can't, I was working with a company a little while ago where. They had a, an influx of, of, of young new staffers. And of course, they brought these ideas of boundaries and I'm not going to pick up the phone at two in the morning and I'm going to go for a run on Saturday and you're not, you know, whatever, all those sorts of things that the generation before my generation would have been too terrified to ask for, exactly. or let alone demand. Mm-hmm. And it, it was interesting, this company, there was a woman who was uh, in her 40s and already there. And she had, she was, she had spoke to me in the same way that you were there a moment ago that she was always feel she felt she had to be reachable all the time mm-hmm. and she was always you know getting back to people instantly she kept her thing on in the night sometimes an email would come in from an overseas colleague and wake her up but she would deal you know this sort of just crazy and and she she said she did it I, I said why did you do that she said well I felt that felt that my boss expected that yeah. and then through this influx of young uh new staffers demanding a change it, she ended up having a conversation about it with her boss and her boss said to her I never expected you to do that, right? I mean, exactly. I, I kind of thought it wasn't that healthy, even. But I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I, thought, I thought you wanted didn't it. Didn't want to overreach. Was, yeah. it, it was just sort of awkward. I just, you know, I thought that's the way you roll, and it's, yeah. you know, it's not a bad thing for me to get stuff quickly. But I don't need it that fast. You know? So totally. so often we're kind of caught in these silos where we're just marinating in what we think are other people's expectations, but are wrong, right? And 100%. so we're living up to a gold standard that nobody actually. Expects. to right or the wrong right. standard it's that's why I, whenever i do any kind of work with a firm it's always getting people to sit down and just talk right to talk because so often people are hunkered down in their own bunkers right with their own ideas about what people in the other bunker want or expect or feel and, and get people sitting around a table and you those the blinkers fall off and suddenly it becomes not only permissible but actually productive to say let's have some boundaries here because we're all going to be better employees, better bosses, better human beings. If we do, we're going to be more productive as a company. right? Absolutely. Tell me a little bit more about the work that you do with companies. I'd, I'd love to hear some of the outcomes that you've been able to facilitate and some of the things that you've been able to debunk for, for companies. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do. I mean, there's a lot of keynoting, but I do, I do some sort of workshopping as well. So I'll go in and get companies to usually it will start with a keynote and then there'll be a sort of follow up, you know, half day or something, or sometimes longer. And that's where you do a bit of a deeper dive where you're looking at taking these ideas of slow and, and applying them in a specific company. Cause this is one of the things, again, I think in our speed culture is that we expect everything to be the same, right? As globalization, you just move widgets through the system as fast as possible. They're all the same, but no company is the same as any other company. So there's, you can't just, you know, hear an idea about slow and pull down this thing fully formed and plug. It's not plug and play, right? You you really need to do some due diligence. You need the company as a whole needs to pause and take that time. I was referring to earlier, just to reflect, look into the peer into the nooks and crannies and make sense of the interstitial spaces and get people talking. And, and that's usually the starting point is just to get those conversations going and then to create structures and policies and initiatives that work specifically for that company. And then to keep checking later on, because you can put in the best laid schemes right today, but things change and 
people move and person, you know, and, and six months from now it, it needs a tweak or it, it's fallen back to the old ways and you need to keep going. Right. It's a little bit like when you talk about coming, overcoming the, our addiction to speed, it's a little bit like overcoming any kind of addiction, right? It's like an alcoholic is all, only ever one drink away from being, uh, you know, from another bender um, often. Um, and, and I think that's the same with slow is that you kind of slow down and, there's so much pressure. There's so much temptation to speed up around us that we need to be on a guard all the time, you know, just and creating guardrails, creating structures that keep us pointing in the right direction, keep us channeling that powerful thing that is slow and not getting distracted or pulled back into the old ways, just be through inertia or old habits or other people's impatience, because those things are always going to be there trying to knock us off course. So true. So Carl, what would you say to someone who perhaps has one of those prototypical tech style, like MVP, let's go fast, let's go hard, let's disrupt things, like that kind mm -hmm. of hard charging boss? Because as we all know, the way in which you work, right, that you're, I should say, as we all know, your work experience is largely defined by your direct manager. So if you yeah. have one such boss who doesn't necessarily... Uh, belong to the cult of slow, if you will, who is all about the speed. <laughs> what are some gentle ways that people can kind of push this concept on someone who might seem resistant? Yeah. You mean apart from giving them my book? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, you can absolutely <laughs> give the them start, your the book. It's, I love it's it. actually, I say that as a joke, but it's funny how often people say to me, I left my, I left your book on a, on a <laughs> desk. Your book on my boss's, my boss's desk. Um, <laughs> that is <laughs> awesome. Leaving, leaving that log roll to one side. Uh, I think I, I would suggest this. Uh, it, it's harder to uh, um, approach a boss like that alone. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 more helpful to get a group of people who feel the same, that they would be doing better work, they'd be happier, healthier, all the good stuff that everybody's going to benefit from if they could slow down and get away from that kind of hard charging, always on approach of that particular boss. And and then don't corner that boss, you know, in the in the toilet and, and, you know, and, and start haranguing, you know, approach gently and obliquely and, and sort of ask questions. I, th I think very often it helps to start with a, um, like a coffee morning or something where you just pinpoint one thing you, instead of attacking or criticizing or questioning the whole approach of that boss, zero in on one thing. So it might be the fact that people are expected to answer emails at 10 PM or something, and just have a conversation about that together and then propose a pilot project. Say, Love what if we just tried a week where everybody, when we got home, we could all after 8 p.m. or whatever it is, you know, after six, we leave the office, no one has to look at whatever it is, right? And, and just let's try it for a week, right? No, 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 nobody's signing up for anything lifelong here. Let's right. try it for a week. And at the end of the week, we'll come back together and we'll just debrief. What, what did it feel like? Did it, was it good? Did it work? Did it help us? Could we do more of it, less of it? Was it a total failure? You know? <laughs> and, and, and I think get, get the conversation going because it's one thing for a boss like that to be challenged, to be presented with ideas, to be, to hear the case for slow. It's another thing to experience it right? yeah, <laughs> because that true. experiential thing I think is immensely potent, right? That's how people change is by feeling that a new way of doing things would work for them. So just little baby steps, gentle, try a little thing out, see what it feels, you know, that kind of thing and, and build from there. And yeah. I think very often you'll find that the boss who, you know, barks the loudest about everything being fast is often the one who's most desperate to slow down in a mm, weird kind of way. Yeah. You know, it's almost a kind of, they're almost <laughs> running away from their own need to slow. It's yeah. a, it's a way to cover up and mask yeah. their own doubts about slowness. Yeah, totally. Um, I know even Bill Gates went on the record quite recently to say, you know, I should have taken more weekends. Yes, I should have. Yeah. I so that. I was like, yeah. Hey, if it, granted he has the benefit of, you know, literal billions of dollars to step back yeah. and say that now. So whatever, I wonder how he would have, uh, I wonder how he would have fared if someone had approached him with this concept of slow back in the, back in the day, but you live, you learn, you get older, you get wiser. And he now sees the error of his ways. Right. And yeah. all the lost time, all the lost experience. And I think as I, get older, I'm just so keen to savor everything. I just want to be in the present as much as possible. And I, I have ADD in the attentive type. And so that's also difficult because I can get distracted at a moment's notice, right? So I, I have to really very, very uh, deliberately sit with myself and say, no, uh, you know, turn off the notifications and be really, you know, guess what? Time blocking. 
excellent way of working. Mm-hmm. Turns out it really works. It's, it's kind of an old <laughs> trick, but I was like, oh, okay, there's something to this. But, um, you know, older, wiser, right? I just, the, the longer I go on, the more tips I figured out along the way and the more things I pick up. And I just, yeah, I, I really, I'm so happy that you are doing the work you are because it's so needed in the society. And I can't tell you how many times I joke with my friends and we're all like, gosh, thank God it's Monday. That weekend just killed me. You know, like I went to seven kids' birthday parties, two or three games, like shuttled my kids back and forth, you know, it made dinner for the week, like all of it. It's just yeah, crazy. Um, it is crazy. We need this. So it's really important work. I'm really glad you're doing yeah. it. So tell me, leave us with some hope for the future in terms of us being able to slow down. Well, I think that we've been on an upward curve of acceleration now for a good century and a half. <laughs> yeah. And and I think it's pretty clear that we've reached the stage of diminishing returns, that things have just got way too fast, right? We're burning out the planet. We're burning out the people on it. It just doesn't make any sense to carry on like this anymore. And I think that the the the, the, the tectonic plates really are shifting here culturally. And, and we've talked already a few times about the the, the young generation coming through, they have very, very different views, priorities, and so on. And they're going to, as they move up through the ranks, are going to have more and more sway and more and more clout. And they're going to remake this world in a way that if I had to sum it up in one word, I'd sum it up as slow. So Love I it. think I think that like, the change is, the times there are changing and they're changing in the right direction. It can't come fast enough. This uh, right? The slow it can't come time, fast but it's, enough. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I very much look forward to, uh, I only have one speed, meaning actually slow rather than fast. <laughs> like I can't <laughs> wait for that time. So thank you so much for sharing all of the work you've been doing on this front and for being a wonderful advocate for us all to get more out of the life we have at whatever age we're living in. So thanks, Carl. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure chatting. Mm-hmm.